over my years in ministry, one of the things that fascinates me is the number of people who tell me that they are afraid to take the last step and accept Jesus Christ. That fear is the thing stopping them from making that decision. When I press down on what is the cause of that fear, the fear is what they're going to have to give up. The fear is what are we going to have to give up to follow Jesus? This morning in the passage that we are in, in Luke chapter 9, uh, Jesus has something to say about that subject. We're going to read Luke 9, 51 through 62. You can follow along in the overhead. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And he said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. But the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Now here is what is going on. Two and a half years have passed since Jesus began his public ministry. And he has dodged death multiple times. We don't read about every incident in Scripture, nor have I emphasized it in my preaching. But he has been facing death multiple times, and he simply walked away. At this moment, he knows if he goes back to Jerusalem, the temple authorities will destroy him. He knows that. It's a well-known public fact. They want to get rid of him. At this moment, he says, we're going to Jerusalem. And as it says in the verse, it's, it was time for his ascension, meaning his time to leave his earthly body and assume his heavenly presence. And so he turns to go to Jerusalem, and the quickest and fastest way to get there is to go through Samaria. And so they start through Samaria. He realizes they're going to need a place to spend the night, and so he sends James and John to make arrangements for where we're going to spend the night. Now the Samaritans would have gladly welcomed Jesus. They would have welcomed him and, and just gone all out for him, except for one thing. The Samaritans believed that their temple up on the hill was the place where God lived. Oddly, the Jews thought their temple in Jerusalem was the place where God lived. If Jesus had said to the Samaritans, God's up there on the hill, I'm staying right here and I'm going to be with you, they'd have been all over him. But instead he said, I'm going to Jerusalem. And what does he say? God lies in the temple in Jerusalem. That's essentially what the Samaritans heard. And so they want nothing to do with it. So James and John, the sons of thunder, said, All right, we're going to fix this. We'll call down fire and we'll destroy it. If you want evidence, once again, that James and John and the rest of the disciples have yet to have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, once again, here it is in this passage. What does Jesus say to him? That's not what we came here for, boys. We didn't come to destroy people. We came to save them. We didn't come to call down the wrath of God upon those we disagree with. We came to explain the message of salvation to people. Now the Greek word that is translated in as destroyed literally means to loosen the building from its foundation so that it eventually collapses. To loosen the building from its foundation so that it eventually collapses. That's the original meaning of what Jesus said. We didn't come here to loosen people's foundations so they ultimately fall down. He said instead, the original Greek word that's translated as save literally translates to to deliver from destruction. We came to deliver people from destruction. The destruction of a lost life and the destruction of eternity spent in the wrong place. And then he says the phrase, that phrase is what struck me. That, that is what spoke to my spirit, spoke to my heart. We didn't come to destroy people. We came to save them. 
Now, one of the misunderstandings that people have when they say, I'm afraid to accept Jesus Christ, is they don't understand that heaven is not over there. Heaven starts here. One of my unspoken desires that I'm not even sure Pam is fully aware of is I would really like to visit the homeland of my ancestors. And my ancestors, one half of them, comes from Ireland. And I would dearly love to go to Ireland someday. Actually looked into it with one of our, our, our sons once upon a time. It's very expensive to go to Ireland. And so if I were to do that, I would have to scrimp and save. And our lives would be quite miserable for a while as I squeezed every dollar out of our budget to try to save up enough money for Ireland. And it might take months and it might take years of miserable living and scrimping and saving it just so I could go one day to Ireland. But the point of the fact is I'm Irish right now. I, I can enjoy being Irish right now. I have all the blessings and all the amazing qualities and all of the flaws of Irish people. I don't have to wait to go to Ireland to enjoy the benefits of being Irish. People mistakenly think that heaven is a place. One day we're going to go to a place. Heaven is a relationship. Heaven is a relationship that starts now. As you've heard me say repeatedly, that's the whole point of creation. Is a relationship. God created us to be in relationship with us. Relationships can start here and now. <clears throat> when people say to me, I'm afraid to accept Jesus, they totally misunderstand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that we need to do as the church family of God is to focus on what you get. And stop emphasizing what you give up. Did you notice the title of today's message? Anybody pay attention to the marquee or the bulletin? Today's message is called Melancholy Christian. Anyone give me a definition of melancholy? Melancholy? A, a state arrived at through thoughtful sadness. Oh, woe is me. I have to be the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Washington. I had so much better hopes. I was trying so much for higher than what. I just, I'm a melancholy pastor. Is that what we project to the world? Is that the image? Why do you think I gave you a smiley face today to wear on your clothing? Because I wanted everybody else to see all the smiley faces to remember. Right? We have a reason to be happy. We don't have a reason to be melancholy. In fact, melancholy Christian is an oxymoron. You know what an oxymoron is, right? Jumbo shrimp. <laughs> melancholy Christian. What we get is so much more than what we give up. I, I, most of you don't know me all that well, because we haven't spent a lot of time together. But by and large, and Pam will testify to this, I'm a happy guy. I mean, nine days out of ten, I have a smile on my face, a joke right around the corner, and words of encouragement, you know? I'm, I'm a very encouraging guy. Well, years ago, I, I had 135 people working for me. And I worked 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and I had a smile on my face most days. And all the people around me were very nice and very comfortable to work with, very sweet. One night, we had three children under the age of seven at that particular point in time. We had one of those nights that young parents get to enjoy every now and then. You know what I'm saying? We didn't sleep very well, Pam more so than I. But nonetheless, I overslept. That made me late. I couldn't eat breakfast. I got to work. I was, my stomach was growling. Pretty soon the rest of me was too. And I hadn't been there very long, and I noticed that my secretary, Tina, was seemed to be in a very unhappy mood today. And I could not figure that out, because Tina's a very happy girl. And, and I noticed after a while that the bookkeeper was surly. You know? And then about two or three hours I've been there, and I had a chance to talk to the computer programmer. Her name is Donna. She worked for me for years and years, and she was very, very short with me. 
And I said, look, Donna, what's going on? I mean, the whole office seems to be growling at each other. I just don't understand what's going on. She said, well, you've always smiled. And today you came in not smiling, so we assumed that somebody did something wrong, and we've been trying to figure it out all morning. <laughs> and point of fact, I wasn't angry, I wasn't upset, I was tired. And I what I saw in the people around me was a reflection of what was coming from me. I had a pastor friend many years ago who used to tell his congregation, if you're going out to lunch today and you're going to have roast pasta for lunch, <laughs> please make sure that your bulletin is out of sight. I don't want people to know where you've been to church. Particularly if you're going to not tip the waitress, please do not mention the name of the church. Because that's not what we're supposed to project. That's not the image that we want. We should be smiling, encouraging people. We have reason to smile. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy you. I came to lift you up, to encourage you, to give you full life, full benefit. This is not the only passage of Scripture who, who says this. Paul writes in, the, in, I think it's Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5. He says, live in peace with one another. We urge you, brothers, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everybody. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. That means have a smile on your face. Why should we have a smile on our face? Because the definition of joy is I have a source of happiness within me. I am serene. I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen to me. I think it's, it's hard if you do this long enough, if you preach long enough, you have trouble remembering now that I preached that in Kansas or West Virginia or was that in Indiana. And so I can't remember if I explained the difference between joy or happiness and joy, but I'm going to quickly do that again this morning. Happiness is an external situation. I, I reflect my external surroundings and I'm happy. If Pam is in my house and taking care of things, I'm happy. All right? If I am healthy, I'm happy. If I get to play golf, I'm very happy. But if the external circumstances change, I'm not very happy. Pam was gone for 15 days. I wasn't very happy. Just very selfish. She went to visit her mother. It was a good thing. If I go without eating for a couple hours or four hours or six hours or ten hours, I'm not very happy. If I don't get enough sleep, I'm not very happy. But joy is a result of my internal situation. I can be joyful because I know what is going on. I can be joyful even if I get bad news from a doctor. I told you a couple of weeks ago, the doctor said to me, I think you have lung cancer. I said, how can that be? I've never smoked. I've never worked with asbestos. I've never been around fine dust or anything. He said, I don't know, but I think you got it. But I don't. It's something else. But I, I wasn't very happy for a while because I was scared. But happiness is different from joy. Joy comes from our convictions on the inside. Paul tells his Christian friends, always rejoice in all circumstances. Martin Luther once wrote, Nothing has done more harm for the cause of Jesus Christ than black clothes and long faces on Christians. In his day, if you didn't wear black clothes, you were considered to be irreverent. You know, everybody came to the church wearing black. I have not been a bivocational pastor very long. I was very young, very raw, and I was in a country church, and it was full of older people, 19 of them to be exact. And uh, after I started there, people started coming. They were curious about this new guy. And a young couple started coming, had two young children, and they just brought a fresh thing, just a fresh life to the church. It was so much fun. 
And they didn't know who Jesus was. And it was quite obvious that the husband was very interested. And man, I was eager to sell it to him. Boy, I'm going to give it to him, right? And he'd been there about six months, and I started visiting them in their home. And I could tell he wanted to say yes, and he was getting close. And I kept pressing on him, you know? My style, if I don't get what I need the first time, I just press a little harder. Anybody amen to that? <laughs> no, that's my style. And I just pressed a little harder. I kept, you know, you know make it a seat. Come on, you can do it. Come on. And one day, they never came back to church anymore. They were there every Sunday for months. And then, bang, they were gone. They never came back. I called them. They didn't refuse my calls. They tried to stop by and see them. They wouldn't let me in the door. Like, what is going on? And finally, about eight months after that, one of his friends came to me and said, I can explain to you what happened. I'm just going to use the word Chris. It wasn't Chris, but I'm going to use the word Chris just for fun. He said, well, Chris has three buddies that he rides to work with every day. They work at Ormet. That's a big manufacturing plant on the river. And they drive about 40 miles each way with these three guys. And every night when they come home, before they get to their house, where do they go? To the bar. And they all have beer. They have a couple, three beers before they go home. And Chris really wanted to accept Jesus. He really did. He was all set, you know. But then he had, he, had, he thought... Do I want to give up having a beer with my buddies and accept Jesus? Or do I want to have a beer with my buddies? And when it came down to buddies or Jesus, guess who won? Beer. The beer with the buddies won. And just for the record, and you can fry me for this, nowhere in Scripture does it say you can't have a beer with your buddies. It says don't overdo it. Don't get drunk. Don't ever be intoxicated. It says that clearly, repeatedly. Not saying drink. But the point of the story is he was afraid of what he had to give up. He didn't understand that coming to Jesus doesn't mean that you have to give up. I mean, you'll come convicted one day and walk away from it, most likely. It was so sad, and I have no idea if he ever gave his life to Jesus or not. Once upon a time in the late 1400s, um, if, if in England, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have set that up. In England, if the king was in residence, if the king was in his castle, they would fly a flag. I think they still do that, by the way. If the king or queen is in residence, is there physically on the spot, they have a flag that flies above the castle. And they say, I'm trying to find what they say exactly. Um, Joy is in the flag. Oh, that's the, that's the, uh, anyway, I don't remember what they said. But a monk from the 15th century wrote this, Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of one's heart that indicates the kings of residence. I love that. I love that. Joy is the flag that flies over a person's heart when it indicates that the king, Jesus Christ, is in residence. You know that there are scientific evidence that Cheerful people get less sick. They, they don't get sick nearly as often as sour people. There is scientific evidence to prove that people who are sour and crabby and angry get sicker more often, contract more illnesses than people who are cheerful. You could say that the surly bird catches the germ. <laughs> I like that. If I'm preaching a sermon about smiling and being happy, I'm going to tell a few jokes and, and try to get you to smile and laugh. But it is true, the source of our joy comes from inside. Melancholy Christian is an oxymoron. A monk in the 1200s wrote, There are no sad saints. Charles Swindoll said, Grimness is out of the Christian character. Billy Graham wrote, the gloomy Christian is an oxymoron. Joy. We are to have a source of joy. We are to be optimistic. An optimist is an elderly man who marries a younger lady and asks the realtor to find a house near a school. We are to be optimists. We are to be joyful. An optimist is a person who says to his wife, I'll be home at 7.45 and he has a 7 o'clock executive council meeting. 
<laughs> An optimist is one who said, believes when the preacher says, and in conclusion, <laughs> but in conclusion, I have a story I want to share with you, as I often do. This is a true story, by the way. Someone I knew once upon a time in West Virginia. I'm going to call the lady Debbie. It's not her real name. Debbie was a very, very pretty girl. She was a, a West, Miss West Virginia finalist. And she lived the first 38 years of her life trying to be as glamorous and as attractive and as well-received as humanly possible. She did all the exercises and she wore all the right makeup and all the right clothes and the right shoes and she always dressed to perfection and smiled at everybody and everybody loved Debbie. And she got married and she, she married a Christian. And he tried to share with her that, that, that God doesn't care about your looks. It's about what's inside that counts. And slowly over a number of years, she came to know Jesus Christ. And she began to live her life for something other than her beauty and her looks and her glamour. They had a couple of children, and when she was in her late 40s, 48 I think, I don't remember exactly, she contracted cancer. And they operated, and they radiated, and they chemoed, and they thought they got it. And a few months later, it was back, and it was back in the place where her shoulders and her neck and her spine all would come together back there, and it was kind of underneath the spinal column. It was a place where it you couldn't really operate. And she had so weak from the previous treatments and, and had not been able to eat very much, and, and the surgeon said to her, Look, you know, I, I am sorry, Debbie, but I, I can't do this. I just I just cannot in good conscience do anything. <clears throat> and she had a silver goblet on her nightstand in the hospital. And she said, pick up the silver goblet and read what it says. And engraved on the side of the silver goblet was this. Never forget, your cup overflows of death. And she said, I am not a blind optimist. She said, I know the realities of what we're facing. But she said, I also have a conviction at the deepest level of my soul that my cup runneth over and my time is not done. I am convicted I will see my middle school children get married and have children of their own. She said, my death will not be on your record. My healing will be on your record. the surgery. And you obviously know what the end of the story is or I wouldn't tell the story. Now that doesn't happen to everybody. But it happens fairly consistently with people of deep faith. In point of fact, Debbie lived and was still alive when I left West Virginia, whatever it was, 12 years ago, 10 years ago. And her, her faith caused her surgery to come to Jesus Christ. She had a testimony she shared for years thereafter. My cup runneth over. When asked after the operation, what caused this, the doctor said, quote, I have seen enough patients to know that ones who are convinced their cups running over with the Holy Spirit do better in surgery than those who have no faith, unquote. You know, I have never been denied access to a pre-op room in my entire life as a pastor. Do you know why? Because doctor after doctor and nurse after nurse tell me the same thing. True story. I want you to pray for her. Because patients who are praying for do much better than those who are not. We are born again, saved Christians. We should rejoice always. We have a joy in our heart that cannot be denied. We should have a smile on our face and joy in our heart. It should define who we are. You have a smiley face for your clothing today and a cardboard emoji with a smile of one kind or another for your home to remind you. But we are not melancholy Christians. 
There is no such thing. We should be filled with joy. We have the most blessed thing of all. We have Jesus Christ in our hearts. We know what's going to happen. There is nothing this world can throw at you that can counterbalance the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Do not be a melancholy Christian. Holy Father, thank you for this message. And may we remember it each day as we look at the emoji put up in our house on the refrigerator or the bathroom mirror. May we understand that people are drawn to you or driven away from you based on what they see in our lives. That the number one way people have of coming to trust you is if they trust us first. And they will only trust us if they see the authentic Jesus alive in our lives. On this day, Father, as we look at the sticker and as we look at the emoji, may we always remember there's a reason for joy if we have Jesus in our hearts. These things I ask in his name.